to the GHT Overland Podcast. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on the GHT Overland Podcast. Lisa, what was your most memorable family road trip? It would be out of Pierce, Idaho. Pierce, Idaho? Who all went? You have five brothers and sisters, but they're mostly all older than you? Yep. I'm the baby. Well, you and your brother. Yeah. I'm still the baby though. (laughs) You're twins. (laughs) Yeah. Still the baby? Yep. All right. Fair enough. Anyway, who all went? Was it just you, mom and dad, or did everybody else go too? No, just uh, mom and dad and my twin brother and I. So it was the four of you. Yep. And what was your vehicle of choice? Oh, Chevy pickup with a towing a... Just like one, the old style bench seat. All four of you sat on one bench seat. Yeah. Actually, (laughs) come to think of it, bench seat, uh, open, what do you call it, in the back? Had all of our equipment. Canopy? No, no, no. no. Camper? No camper. Camper. We pulled no the clue. we pulled the twenty foot something trailer. A trailer. Yeah. Trailer? Yep. That's the word you were looking for? Well no, the back of the pickup in the bed. That's the word. The bed of the truck? The bed of the truck was full of all of our equipment that we had to haul. Are you guys as confused as I am? <laughs> okay, so all the equipment was for gold mining. Okay. So how <laughs> like how long did it take you to get there? Well, I knew I always fell asleep, and before I knew it, we were in Idaho already. How about a, four years on the road and add two more uh, siblings? Oh, dear Lord, no. <laughs> no. No. I'd asked to be left in Pierce, Idaho. So then if you took that, and then imagine in our Jeep, four-door, Jeep Wrangler, and had the boys, and then adopted one more about the same size, <laughs> and traveled for four years in that Jeep, overlanding from New Zealand to Haiti to uh, Canada to the U.S. Well, I think I'd be more open to it now that I'm older, because back then, like, I had a twin brother. You had to go everywhere with me. It was difficult. <laughs> Imagine having two of them. No. And being the only sister. No. Uh, poor Caroline. I'm glad we didn't have twins. That's all I can say. <laughs> so this week's guests are doing just that. Well, and a lot more. So they've gone from Canada to New Zealand, the U.S. Um, they did go to Haiti, but I don't think they took their Jeep to Haiti. And lots of other places. An inspirational family full of love, positivity, and adventure. We think you are going to love to hear their story and pick up a lot of useful tips from their four years of full-time overland travel. Let's launch the introduction and get into part one with Peter and Carol. I agree. Let's do it. Thank you for joining us on the GHT Overland Podcast. This is where you get the greatest interviews and insights from overland travelers around the globe, learning from their stories and experiences as we interview overlanders from places like Australia, Africa, the Americas, Portugal, and today, a little island off the grid 
in Ontario, Canada. You will learn the basics to the advanced and overlanding, so buckle up and get ready for a new adventure. I'm Chris. And I'm Lisa. Today's featured guests are Peter and Carol of the Epic Family Road Trip, a family of five, plus a new member of the crew, the four-legged Lando. In 2015, they made a decision of a lifetime, sell everything, and commence the most epic family road trip around North America. Peter is a public speaker and a business coach working from the road, and we knew Carol was our perfect guest knowing she loves coffee, and we can't wait to learn more about how they make it look so easy with five people on the road in a Jeep Wrangler. And it is our absolute pleasure to welcome Peter and Carol to the podcast today. And thank you for taking the time, not to mention all the extra effort you went through this morning to join us. So welcome. Thank you. Hi, guys. Hello to everybody on the podcast. Glad to be here this morning. Yeah, thank you. We're absolutely grateful that you've taken the time. So if you would, fill us in on any blanks we may have left out in your intro and tell us a little bit more about you. I think that was pretty accurate. That Yeah, we've been on the road um, since 2015, pretty much the end of 2015, uh, pretty much full time. Uh, we stop from time to time um, to put our feet down. We have, a like you mentioned, the off-the-grid cabin. Um, but, but uh, yeah, we've done a lot of miles and had a lot of fun doing it as a family of five. So, yeah, the kids, um, when we started, were a lot smaller than they are now. And so... <laughs> We tend to be outgrowing our vehicles uh, from time to time, but um, especially now they're at least a foot or more taller than when we started. But uh, yeah, we've had a lot of just incredible experiences and, and it's it, we, we're loving every minute of it. Carol, what was your take? Was this his idea, yours or what? <laughs> Um, it was actually our daughter, Caroline, um, was the one that got us going. And uh, she really wanted to go to New Zealand. And we said, oh, wow, okay. So put together a PowerPoint and uh, tell us how we can do it. How much is it going to cost and what do we need to do? Um, and so she did. A, a few days later, she came up and she sold us on the idea. And that's how actually overlanding became something that we kind of were like oh what what is this whole overlanding thing you know um because shipping the jeep just made more sense for the six months that we would be there rather than renting a vehicle yeah yeah. and then it would become ours you know um but yeah that's how it all started was uh caroline saying she really wanted to go on this trip and so we kind of involved the kids with everything that we do um, before with our business and now with our traveling. Yeah, that's really great. So I'm dying to know, how did that hot tub do over the winter? You guys had just <laughs> finished building that when you left the island for, I guess, the season. Is it in good shape? Right. It is. Um, it So it's, it, because it's kiln dried cedar, it takes, it can take up to 10 days. We found out later <laughs> um, <laughs> to, to stretch for the water to absorb into the cedar for it to plug up all the holes. So we're, we're almost to the point where we can uh, use it full time. But on father's day last weekend, we were able to use it and it's just wonderful. Oh, nice. Yeah. It's sitting right by the lake and uh, it's, it's wood burning. So off the grid, you don't need any kind of power source other than a bit of firewood. So yeah, it's, it's nice. That must have been awesome. <laughs> and how soon can you start planting in your garden boxes, Carol? I actually just finished it. Um, we're really excited to, we've already harvested some lettuce and oh, nice. some green onions. Yeah. So this is going to be huge instead of making, you know, that six hour trip going to the grocery store. Um, and especially with the kids growing as fast as they are, we need all the food we can get. So. <laughs> yeah. It has been fantastic. I'm so excited to start harvesting that and and learning more off the grid cooking as well. Yeah, you water and feed them just like a flower, and they keep growing. (laughs) The lettuce or the kids? The kids. Ah, Yeah, Yeah, I mean to to expand on that. Basically, the the first trip we did was around North America. So before we wanted to go overseas, we said, "Why don't we explore our backyard?" So Caroline had the idea, and this came before. We decided to sell everything. We kind of had this uh, throughout our business life. Um, we kept this dream in front of us. and We had written the 
dream of going on a, a three month road trip with our family. And it was an impossible dream at the time because we were so busy. We used to take three, you know, it was hard for us to take three days off, let alone three months. But we wrote the dream down. We stuck it up on a, we put it on a sticky note and stuck it up on our mirror so we could keep it top of mind as a family. So when the opportunity came and, and it was, uh, you know, we thought maybe we could do this. We, we launched out on, on a three month road trip. Now, um, you know, four years later, we're still going, but <laughs> uh, that's kind of where Caroline got this idea to go to New Zealand. And that was really to get really adventurous and go abroad. But we thought, why don't we explore our backyard first? There's so much to see here in North America. And so yeah, in the first, the first 12 months, we um, hit almost every state, including Alaska and um, every province in Canada, including Newfoundland way out on the East Coast. So we had a really amazing journey and we had to move fairly quickly to, to cover all those states and provinces. And so we had to do it again. <laughs> There's just too much in each place, especially when we get out into the West to just pass through a state, you have to really spend some time there. So people ask us, you know, you've been on the road four years and you've covered, uh, you've been to Canada, you've been to the US, you've been to Mexico, you've been to New Zealand, and we've been to other countries, Indonesia and Australia and, and down to Haiti, believe it or not. Um, but they're like, what's taking you so long? <laughs> because, you know, there are these there are these travelers that in four years, they can hit almost every country. Well, our answer to that is we're slow, we're doing what we call slow travel, we're, we're more immersing ourselves in into the area, so that we like to stay in a place until we feel like we belong there. So we've become accustomed to their culture and to their customs and to their way of doing things. For instance, New Zealand, we, we got comfortable driving on the wrong side of the road <laughs> or what they would call the right side of the road. <laughs> How long did that take, Peter? Oh, uh, no, well, you had my help. <laughs> yeah. Carol, Carol was my biggest help. Just reminding me to stay left. It didn't take too long, but the, uh, when we first got there, the Jeep hadn't arrived yet, so we rented a vehicle. So we're driving now a right steering wheel on the left oh, side. Just threw you off both ways. <laughs> yeah, and then when the Jeep arrived, we're now driving an American vehicle. So we're on the, the left side of the vehicle on the Jeep, and then we're driving on the left side. So that was a, a bit of a learning curve again. But it, when, you're, when you're driving with traffic, it's absolutely the easiest thing. Um, to do it's when you're pulling out of a parking lot or a mall or something that you have to remember to pull into the, the left lane. So, but I think, uh, after a week and Carol constantly reminding me, uh, we got the hang of it and then we were good to go. Both of us driving. So that sparks, um, an idea of mine. Oh boy. Yep. So we could relate to not able to get a day <laughs> off from work. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So we'll just start using sticky notes like Carol and Peter, and then we'll give Caroline another assignment for us to start. <laughs> yeah, we're going to need to borrow your daughter. That's there you awesome. go. <laughs> That's yeah. smart. We're going to make well, a one day run up to the Northwest Overland Rally, which I think is five hours from us. And it feels like we're turning the entire world inside out to get that one day off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we were there. Um, it's awesome. For, I always talk about various chapters in your life, and and so we we've been through those chapters, and and so when this chapter opened, we jumped on it. We we wanted to take it. You know, our kids were at a certain age; they're they're teenagers at this point, and we knew that that window's not is pretty short. They're not going to be with us forever. They're onto their own lives and their education and whatever they're doing. So um, we thought, you know, now's the time to go. And for people out there that are thinking about doing something like this, uh, you know, the, the stars never all align. They, the finances don't always make hundred percent sense. Um, no, nothing will ever be hundred percent perfect, but if it's a dream you have, and if it's on that sticky note and you've been looking at it for long enough, um, you just got to do it. And that's kind of, that was our experience. That's great. So is Caroline the planner in the group or who is the planner? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, that's kind of a, 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 something we do together as a family. She, she's really adventurous in terms of, uh, knowing where she wants to go. So New Zealand, she had everything 
every place you want it to go planned, but we don't over plan. We're not really, I mean, we know we have some friends that, that go on overland trips from time to time and, and they send us like a spreadsheet of everywhere they're going and every date there. And we're just amazed how they can be so organized. We, for instance, New Zealand, we just went, we just went and we knew some places that we needed to go like Milford sound for sure. We don't want to miss that in Queenstown. We we're going to go there and the Northlands and, but when we arrived, we just said, okay, where are we going first? And we talked to locals, which is probably our favorite thing to do. That's something we learned over time is talk to someone local, get to know them. They know the best places. Um, and for instance, uh, they said, you know, you're from North America. Your, your winters are different than ours, you know, than us. So what we would recommend you do, you, we got there in November. They said, why don't you go as far South as you can go because it's going to get cold down there first and then work your way north. And just that little piece of local information really made it amazing for us. So we, we did that and we went way down to the South Island and did all that while it was warm down there. And as, as fall started coming on, we were working our way north, which is there getting closer to the equator and uh, we're in the warm weather the whole way. So we were chasing summer the whole time and just had an absolute blast. Oh, but we had cool. learned... Awesome. You know, there's hikes like the most popular hike that you see on Instagram and everybody goes there and gets that picture. And then you talk to someone local and they say, you know what, there's a there's one equally as good. Nobody goes there. You can go climb that one, get beautiful pictures and you'll probably run into two people instead of a, a big crowd. So um, we we'd take their advice and we'd have a, a better experience. So that's one tip we'd say. I always talk to someone who lives there. That's smart. Yeah. So I'm curious how the motorhome worked out for you guys and why you downsized to just the Jeep. Yeah, <laughs> the motorhome was, uh, has been amazing for us. Uh, but, and, and so I, I tell people, you know, we're brand new to this. We're living in a big house where we, we'd go camping, but we we're not living on the road. So it was all, it was so new and our kids were really small or fairly small and, and young and it was new for them. So we thought a motorhome, and it's a small one. We got it's a Mercedes uh, chassis with a Winnebago back. It's called a Winnebago View. Um, we thought that'll give us kind of that feeling of home, and it'll house all five of us and give us a few of the comforts of home as we head out on this journey. And so that was kind of that was our initiation into traveling and moving and experiencing new places and sleeping in places that you know can be quite. Well, Walmart parking yeah. lots and, you know, Cabela's <laughs> and it, it is, you know, yeah. off on the side of the road. It, it's really strange at first. It's kind of like a culture shock. Sure it is. Yeah. Know? I mean, it's exciting, but it's so also nerve wracking sometimes. Yeah. The and, first couple of nights I did not sleep like in flying J's and stuff. But now if you put me in that, I'm like, I see one and I'm like, oh, your shoulders relax. And you're like, oh, we're home. Yeah. I mean, great. <laughs> That it's easy now, but uh, at first, uh, and, and for young family or families out there, you might have those same inhibitions about going on the road. And, and I totally get that. And it's a little bit scary, um, you know, being in a remote parking lot in Alaska and you, you have no idea where you are, but you're parking and it's pitch dark at night and you're hoping there's no grizzly bears walking by. But um, so that the motorhome idea gave us that comfort uh, uh, up front security. and at first and that security. Yeah. But over time, the kids especially got more and more adventurous and they're so we would break out from the motorhome. We'd leave it as kind of a base camp. That would be like somebody else's home. And we'd take off on these overland raw overland adventures just in the Jeep and we're rooftop tent camping, just like our six months in New Zealand, or we'd go out into the Denali highway or something in Alaska, or we, you know, we recently did Baja just with the Jeep or spent two months, um, in uh, Arizona and Utah in that area that those type of excursions we'd go on and when the kids got back to the motor home they're like you know what I totally like that lifestyle better <laughs> so the motorhome became almost too luxury for them which I don't think every teenager is going to feel the same way but we're we're thankful our kids are that adventurous so they prefer the rooftop tent to to an, a motorhome so that's kind of how that got going. So, you know, we're at the point now where we're 
thinking about selling the RV and buying another vehicle to, so that, and the kids are big enough now that we barely fit in the Jeep. So we might get a gladiator or something and follow behind and have them follow behind or lead. Oh, there that you go. Cause Caroline can drive now, right? Yeah. Caroline and Peter would be able to drive. Daniel's just 14 or 15. He just turned 15. So he'll yeah. be fairly soon, but, um, you know, that gives us a convoy, which is great for security. It also gives the kids the, the leg room and the, the time loan that they might want or need. And, and problem solving, you know, for yep. them, if they're driving and figuring things out. Um, yeah, I think it's a little different. bit of autonomy, which is great for teens. And then it also is a recovery vehicle because uh, one of their favorite things to do and ours as well is just to get way off road and camp in incredibly remote places. But there are times you, you get stuck. So. Uh, <laughs> Remember we just recently and the boys were running around rescuing people with the max tracks and like having to, you know, pull them out and yeah. do things like that. So. We're in the desert and, and a big storm came through and some tourists, I guess, had rented a Jeep, <laughs> didn't know how to use it properly. And someone else who was more an artist who was out painting, but then her vehicle got stuck. And so the kids have learned uh, vehicle recovery over the years, that's for sure. That's great. Well, we're so impressed with how this works for your family of five. If you would run through the vehicle stats for us of your Jeep and any name that you've given it. Well, Caroline named it uh, Vandy and uh, she thought that fits. Our last name is Van Stralen. Um, my parents were from Holland. So there's that, that Netherlands uh, route there. And so Vandy's uh, based on a Dutch word or is a Dutch word meaning the traveler. So it kind of, uh, oh, okay. yeah, it was fitting. It's a two, I mean, it's a 2012. Yeah, it's a 2012 four door JK. Arctic uh, edition. Arctic edition. We've put on, um, we've upgraded the suspension. We have an AEV suspension with a, it's a 4.5 dual sport deal. Cause I mean, we're, we're always adding weight and the kids are getting bigger and we're carrying more food and all that stuff. So, um, we recently had to upgrade the springs. AEV has these high capacity coils that we put on and that's made a huge difference. So we've, we've done upgrades. We have um, put on a winch and a snorkel and rooftop tent, a, a full rack on top, front runner rack. Um, we have spare fuel, spare water, all the stuff you need for getting off the grid. And Most importantly, the, the solar panels and dual batteries um yeah dual battery system under under the hood so that it can power the fridge which we charge by solar uh there's a propane tank on the back which runs the cook stove and then we just have a ton of gear uh that we found useful we've we have less than when we started we kind of took off with just we thought we need all this stuff and then we've kind of honed it over the years what we actually use and if something's been you know, three months in, in our trailer and never been used, then it's probably not something we need. So that's kind of how we figure out what we actually need. And how much solar do you guys use? The battery will run the accessories on the Jeep for a, a week no, and under normal conditions. So, it's, you know, it really depends. We get a sunny day. We're over camped in a place where it's sunny. We just pop on the, uh, the solar panels. We use uh, a trifold by uh, Overland Solar which is a great company. They're all American made, but they um, recently came out with an even smaller unit, which produces the same amount of uh, energy. So they're shipping us one. We should get that soon. But yeah, there's, uh, there's been a lot of innovations in the last three, four years since we got started. Uh, things just keep getting better. So if you're just kitting out your uh, rig now, you're four years ahead of when we started and, and things are smaller, lighter, lighter, which is, in overlanding that's the key there's three things one you want your your stuff that you buy to be light it needs to be very compact especially if you have three kids and you're in a jeep <laughs> um <laughs> right and then it needs to be a multi-purpose if possible so that it can do the job of say two pieces of equipment or three and when you find something that has those three uh properties then it's probably something good to take with you and do you know, is it like a 500 watt solar panel or do you know what the size is? Um, it, no, it's just, uh, I think it's just 120, that one. Okay. Yeah. But the, the new one is called a bug out, which you're sending. It's 120 as well, but it's, a, it rolls up. 
So it rolls into a very tight little package and, and you can just slip it in be, into the Jeep anywhere, really. Carol, it always seems very impressive on how seamless your cooking goes for you. Can you tell us, our listeners, about your setup and any tips you recommend that you might have? Yeah. So with cooking, um, we've learned a lot of uh, different tricks. Um, we love our tumble tusk. Um, it's a scottle. Yeah, it's a scottle. And you need a small propane with it, or you can hook it up to your main propane. Um, that one, it saves on water because of the dishes. Like, it's only one one big, um, what would you call that, Peter? Uh, the scottle? It's, yeah. it's like, are, are you guys familiar with the scottle, or do you think your, yep. your viewers are? Yeah. That's a great piece of equipment. It's, it's basically like a disc from a plow, and, and then there's a burner under the middle, and you can just... Uh, cook almost anything on there really yeah we've cooked a lot on there i mean all like three you know different uh sides for our one meal and that saves me from doing you know three different pots and then all the other you know accessories that i need to cook with right so water's huge especially when you're out there for you know a long time you don't want to be wasting it on doing all the dishes so i use that when we're really off the grid um, and then I also have a solar oven, um, which has been the funnest thing ever. And uh, I love pulling that out, especially on, you know, warm days. I can do anything from, you know, doing uh, fajitas to um, uh, cookies when the kids are out surfing. And it's just neat because I'm not wasting any propane or any fuel. I'm just using the power of the sun. And recently I've turned because Daniel, our youngest son, has gotten really into bushcrafting, and he actually saved us a few times. Peter was on a um, flight, you know, on a trip, and we had run out of all fuel. And I was sitting there going, oh my God, like, how am I going to cook? And he made a fire, and he got out our Dutch oven and just went away, and we had a delicious um, meal over the fire. Mm -hmm. And I think learning those skills, like we had spaghetti squash, for our noodles and we just made a wonderful um spaghetti so. spaghetti and uh he made bread on sticks and it was just uh it was so much fun i was so impressed and i learned a ton of stuff from my youngest son <laughs> it was a little That's humbling great. actually uh, so outdoor <laughs> but, chef in the making yeah yeah, yeah. No kidding but okay so, uh, I, so you mentioned think, cookies we need to meet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll need to send us a picture of the uh, the solar oven. That's pretty that's pretty interesting. Our last guest, Brenton of Four by Far Adventures, also mentioned the scottle. I would describe that as a like a wok, and then you would put the the gas burner underneath that to be able to cook it. But correct me if you disagree, Carol. It saves a bunch of space opposed to like a two burner, I don't know, like a Coleman stove. And it saves a lot of time in cleanup, as you had mentioned, like washing and cleaning with water. Yes, correct. I mean, um, you said it perfectly. It's all about saving water and saving, you know, washing dishes and all that kind of stuff. So, and it's just so fun to, to cook on it. It's, it's very much like a, a wok. You can deep fry a battered shrimp or, or fish or whatever it's very versatile, so that's a that's a must-have. We also have a slide-out um, two-burner stove that's mounted under the fridge, and that's handy as well for cooking. Um, so really, like Carol said, it's all about uh, thinking about water conservation. So not using a tool that doesn't require so many dishes like you would have at home. There's no dishwasher yet for a, a overland vehicle, as far as we know. <laughs> what? <laughs> So um, there's that. And then the storage of food. We, uh, we have two big Yeti style, a Yeti cooler and, and another one. And then Orion. we have, um, yeah, an Orion. And then we have a slide out uh, fridge freezer combo. So it's food storage is another important thing. And, um, and we've, our capacity has increased as the kids have grown. It was easier when they're smaller. They didn't eat as much, but that's something we've learned how to, to do on the road. And it works quite well. And then water storage. We have um, some front runner water storage containers that keep the water fairly cool in hot climates. And, and then for washing dishes, you can buy these little pump up deals 
um, where you pump using your foot or by hand, you pump pressure into the water tank and then it's got a little uh, spray nozzle and that gives you some running water for doing dishes or taking a shower. So, um, yeah, that's it. Those are handy tools as well. Okay. So what tips or thoughts do you have on keeping such a positive family environment, especially with the inherent challenges of three teenagers traveling together in a very tight space? What are your tips for our listeners on that? (laughs) Um, Okay, well, a couple of things. One, the number one thing is something that this kind of lifestyle actually gifts you or gives you as a gift, which is time together to to communicate in our old life where we were extremely busy. Um, you, you struggle to have time to really have those deep and quality conversations because you, you know, someone's always running here or going to the gym or going to work or going to school and you, then you get home and, and you, you don't have the time. So that's a gift that this lifestyle gives you when, when you have kids is the op- many, many, many opportunities to really have good conversations. So that eliminates a lot of the, the typical hassles of, raising teens because you can sit around a campfire and just talk things out and that's what a lot of teenagers really just need is someone to listen carol's better than me as a listener i'm a professional speaker so i got to learn how to listen better but <laughs> <laughs> but um she's really good at that and uh so that's uh, one tip is is just communication eliminates a lot of the typical hassles but another one is um involving the kids i mean we always said we'd continue to do this as long as the kids were having fun if, if they found it boring or not stimulating or whatever then you know we wouldn't keep going but it's their they've kind of it's kind of fostered a sense of adventure within them so they're meeting new people all the time they're learning about new cultures new ways of doing things um our re, uh, our trip down to baja mexico for instance was just they absolutely get excited like we've never seen them before crossing an international border and just everything's so different and that for them is just so so exciting so um they won't be complaining at all in the back of the seat as most people with teenagers think they would be because they're so excited about what's over the next hill or what's what's coming down the road or what's our experience going to be tonight? Where are we camping? You know, you know what's that going to be like? That keeps them enthralled and excited and, and ready for, for the journey. So it's not something that me and Carol are doing specifically to say, wow, kids, you need to really be along in this. They, they are doing that because of the excitement of the journey. And I think uh, also is because we sit down, we try every morning and we have like a 10 minute huddle and we talk about yesterday, we talk about today, we talk about the good things and the bad things. And um, but also with our planning, if someone says, you know, I really, really want to go to New Mexico and see the white sands, then we all go, hey, is, is this something we want to do? We map it out. We talk about how much is this going to cost on fuel? What do we need to do, you know, to to help out? And um, so they have an understanding of the, the cost involved and um, what it's going to take. And so that they're not just sitting there going, well, you know, when are we, are we there yet? You know, they, they understand um, what, what's going on with that. Yeah, there's a sacrifice to be made to, to achieve anything. And so we, that's why we, are, we try to involve them in that thought process. Um, the huddle Carol mentioned is something we took over from our business life. I, I came up with this thing in business that we called the huddle. It was an acronym and H stood for have someone recite our values. So we left with three core values, uh, which are work, play, and care. So work hard. The kids are going to have to work even harder at at school on the road than they would in a classroom because in a classroom, that's a a kind of a a setting that's kind of set up for, you know, you have a teacher kind of forcing you to get things done on the road. You're competing with maybe a a wonderful surf break, which is a hundred feet from your vehicle. So, um, they're going to have to work hard. We're going to have to work hard on our channel. I'm going to have to work hard as a speaker and a coach. And so work was our, our first value. Play was our second value because we believe the family that plays together stays together. So we wanted to, and and also there's really an epidemic of, of anxiety and stress in the world today. And we thought if we just play like we did when we were kids without expecting any outcome, just having fun together, life will be a lot better. And so 
and we we're really good at that we've done a lot of that <laughs> surfing and mountain biking and climbing mountains and hiking and snorkeling and diving and just there's endless opportunities for play on the road and then care is our we brought over from the business as well which stands for create a remarkable experience and our goal traveling was to create a remarkable experience for others as we travel around so it's not just travel for the sake of travel so we 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 say we want to leave the places we visit and the people we meet a little better than we found them and so with those three core values uh that really gave us purpose for traveling so every morning almost every morning we we aren't we miss it from time to time having the huddle and then we really notice once we missed it um but almost every morning we have uh, this huddle. So H is have someone recite our values. We talk a bit about our values, work, play, and care, and give examples of how we've used them and they've turned an outcome for the better. Uh, U is update the team. So we just do a quick update on everything. Uh, D is discuss yesterday. It's a quick uh, discussion of how things went yesterday on their goals and objectives. The second D in huddle is discuss today. What's your number one for today? L is listen and share good news. So anyone that achieves something or have some good personal news to share or or school news or any kind of good news. And then E is energized. We just do a cheer and um, and then we're ready for our day. And that worked great in business. It was very, very successful. And it also works in the family setting. It kind of gives us anchors us for the day and gets us set up on the right foot. So that's uh, a quick rundown on the huddle. That's awesome. Yeah, we might borrow that, Peter, if that's okay with you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah we, we have two, one still at home, but that would be perfect. Yeah. Well, and I think that Peter's really got some good points that in the house setting, you're you're busy with life, right? So sure. you're either doing business or you're going to work, you're going to the gym, the kids have their activities or school, and there's not that fireside chat, if you will, um, right. at the end of every day to go through the day and talk about tomorrow. So that's wonderful. And I think that that's just so awesome to point that out, that that's really a gift that overlanding in the lifestyle that you're leading right now has given you. Yeah, it, it is unique and we don't take it for granted. It's something we're extremely thankful for and has made a huge difference in our in our life as a family for sure it's just a, a wonderful wonderful opportunity and, and we try to take advantage of it every chance we have what is that one thing you value the most either on or in your jeep mm. <laughs> on or in the jeep for me it would be the um the kitchen <laughs> <laughs> food. Those, those yeah food is a, a very important part of the whole what makes it the whole lifestyle fun and just having those, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the home, the kitchen is kind of the heart of the home. A lot of people say, and, and a lot of the gatherings as a family is around food and in the kitchen and no different in overlanding. You'll see us all huddling around, um, when a meal is being cooked and, and just, uh, sharing stories and experiences and having a lot of fun as a family. So yeah, that's, that's a big part of it. Definitely. And Carol for you. Yeah. Um, I would say the tent. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's been amazing, uh, you know, waking up to scenery that just blows your mind and keeping dry when it's been raining for a few days and and you're comfortable. We all squeeze up there and we'll we'll watch a movie. Um, we also have a big side tent, uh, awning type tent uh, by ARB. ARB. And that's been a lifesaver because like, if you just want to spread out a little bit and maybe the, the weather is not very good, we'll just all hang out in there and, um, do our, our work. Our big screen TV is, uh, is a uh, iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> right. And what, uh, rooftop tent do you guys use? I don't remember. We have uh, two CVT tents, um, one on the trailer and one on the Jeep. Okay. And is that usually set up like one for the parents, one for the kids? Yeah. Me and Carol have the uh, the penthouse suite on top of the Jeep nice. and the kids are. <laughs> yeah. And, and sometimes like the kids have like, they'll take their own tents, you know, ground tents, hiking tents, and, you know, they'll go and pitch it somewhere. Um, I don't know. They're really adventurous that way. We, yeah, we do carry ground tents for multi-day hikes if we do that. We 
last year did they went down to the bottom of the grand canyon and you know spent three days hiking in there and stuff like that is great so i guess a third tip for your question about being together with the family all the time um one thing people say what happens if everybody's stressed or everybody's in each other's hair type of situation which is going to happen with any grouping of human beings and we say well that's what hiking's for <laughs> we pull over we, we do a wonderful hike a very strenuous hike sometimes and everyone goes on their own they they uh you, we're all hiking to the to the summit together but you know my son will be going at his own pace he'll be a, an hour ahead of us and another one will be you know 20 minutes behind or whatever and and that's just alone time for the kids and man you come back exhausted and refreshed and you forgot what whatever the uh, stress was about and so taking a nice big brisk hike is is a solution to being cramped up in a vehicle for too long if that ever and i remember um uh couples would ask me they're like well how do you get your kids to go on these hikes and things like that and i found because daniel was uh, quite young when we started 11 turning on to 12 and to go on like a six hour hike, I mean, that was, I mean, a little much for him. Um, so we found that downloading like his favorite, like audio books or like movies, and he can just like listen to them while he hikes was a huge game changer. I mean, he began to yeah, hike smart. faster, faster yeah. than us. And I mean, he was like, oh, it's over. And I'm like, well, that was four hours. He's like, but I was just finishing the uh, Shackleton, you know, <laughs> That's it was great. Like, That's smart. I was just getting to that part. And so I've shared that tip with quite a few other um, parents or, you know, uh, people that have young kids and they're like, oh my goodness, that has sure helped a lot. So plus you're learning something, he's learning something as he goes, you know, reading yeah. a, or listening to a great audio book. And then, you know, he's, yeah. So he's not wasting the time and, it keeps him so preoccupied and then next thing you know we're at the summit and then uh you know it's always worth it at that point because the views uh, blow your mind in most cases so yeah it's a good tip yeah anything you originally packed that you never used or removed from your overall setup besides the motorhome <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, man. Um, um, i would say half of our clothes yeah um yeah Clothes, you do not need a lot of, like, uh, my daughter who, yeah, most teenage girls, you know, overpack on everything. She had a 60 liter bag for six months. Um, that was pretty impressive. Um, and we just use kind of our backpacks and everything is kind of color coded. So like I'm red. So I know that I have the red toothbrush, the red towel, the red, like, you know, Daniel's orange. And so when you're looking for something, you know, all Daniel stuff's orange. So he just has no problem finding it. And, um, so, you know, I had this dream to, to wear flip flops for six months. Um, <laughs> coming, from, <laughs> coming from a business background, uh, you know, always wearing uh, shine shoes. So I was able to, to achieve that dream. But the, the funny thing is you don't need, you know, three sets of shoes and then a pair of boots and this and that. I'm trying to think of any other gear, um, we've really kind of tweaked our gear over time. So getting a scottle eliminates some pots and pans maybe that, you know, we didn't need. Um, but we do, we did combine a lot of our stuff with, um, hiking. hikings. Yeah. So hiking gear, because, uh, you, you learn to work on small equipment and be quite efficient with it. And that's the same stuff you use hiking. Um, and then we do have a we have something called a camp champ which we took to new zealand but we don't really use here in north america but we probably would if we go to australia or somewhere else abroad and that's a, an entire gourmet kitchen in a box i don't know if you've heard of that they're not they're not cheap but they are really it, it is everything you could ever want in a kitchen and it's the it's not camping stuff. It's so high quality. You'd use it in a garden party or even in a, a chef's kitchen. So we we have that camp champ, but um, we don't take it with us everywhere. You know, we're constantly shifting our our gear based on what we're doing, where we're going. So if we're doing the jeep behind the motorhome, then we can't tow the trailer. So we'll leave the trailer somewhere. Um, which right now is in Oregon. So next time we go to the West Coast, we have the trailer and we'll leave the motorhome somewhere and, and hitch up the trailer. So with those adjustments of vehicles, you also make adjustments of equipment. Yeah. So what are your current top two or three destinations 
along with a little detail on what made them so special for you? Um, yeah, that's a, that's an awesome question. I mean, first, uh, the, the simple answer is everywhere we've been has just blown our mind. And it's just been amazing. The people, the, you know, and it's not about scenery. Scenery is, is part of it. So you go to somewhere, for instance, one of them would be in New Zealand, uh, Milford Sound. It's just so spectacular. Um, but really what makes a place special is the experience we had there. So I would say, you know, we had this chance to rescue 120 whales off a beach in New Zealand. We were, the kids had this dream to go to this place called Abel Tasman National Park for a long time. And, and we, it was hard to secure a camp spot there. We finally landed a spot. And literally, as soon as they got the place, the, our whole camp set up, and we had paid for a, a certain amount of time there, <laughs> non-refundable. They got a text from uh, someone that they, someone in America that was seeing on the national news that there was a whale stranding somewhere in New Zealand. And had we heard about it, we hadn't. So they quickly uh, Googled it and found out it was a uh, four hours drive through the remote mountains to a place called Farewell Spit. And they were desperate for some help up there. But they said, don't come up uh, unless you can support yourself. There's no source of water and there's no food. Well, we, with our geared up vehicle, we knew we were the right candidates to go up there. And the kids started packing up immediately and we headed up there and they just had an amazing experience. Spent the whole day doing first aid on the whales, keeping them moist in the hot sun, putting uh, sheets on them and buckets of water and then waiting for the tide to come in. And when the tide came in, they, everybody pushed together and, and we were able to free all 120 whales and they then they all grabbed hands and formed a human chain so they wouldn't come back in because some of their mates had perished on shore and these are very pot oriented animals and they they will come back um, for their mates and so we made noise and held hands and splashed and and then eventually the whales all swam out to sea and none of them rebeached. so it was a i think experiences like that is what makes the place in our memory as one of our favorite places. That's cool. Yeah, that, yeah, that was. Yeah. It's a great story. And another one was our experience in Haiti. Now, Haiti's not a, de uh, a holiday destination. It's certainly not a luxury place to visit, but we had the opportunity to go down with uh, a, a group of other people that one of our companies is an electrical company and they put together 800 solar lights for a village in Haiti that ha has no electrical grid. And the children have been studying at night by a kerosene lamp and there was all kinds of respiratory problems. So they, they got this idea to bring the clean lighting down and we got to go along with the group of about 20 people and teach the families how to use the lights. And then on the, on the last day we handed out their lights and we watched as the, the village of Ferrier lit up for the first time. And so the kids, you know, teaching people double and triple their age how to work a solar panel, a, a battery, and a little LED light was just a re another incredibly rewarding experience that we'll never forget. So even though we were sleeping on the on the floor on cots in a a building that has no AC, air conditioning and it is, there, there's cockroaches running around on the floor. And it's definitely not what you'd call a comfortable experience. That became one of our top experiences just because of the what we were able to do there and the people we met and the impression that it left on us and on the children. Yeah, amazing is what comes to mind. That's just... Yeah, it's all about the experience, right? It really is. Uh, and then the other ones are, are scenery. I mean, you, you walking on glaciers in Alaska or seeing Denali in the background uh, just leaves an impression on you. Or even the beauty of Yosemite. We weren't that long ago. We were down there. Um, that in itself, that, that's a very special place for us, too. I, I don't know if you have time for the story, but a quick story there is our son. In our first year of travel, we were traveling through Yosemite and our son became very ill. He was losing a lot of weight. And um, and uh, we were going to go on a big hike that morning and he's usually the front runner and he just couldn't, he didn't have the energy to go. And so we ended up leaving uh, Yosemite and going down to Fresno to a children's hospital and he got checked in right away with uh, what they call ketoacidosis and he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Oh, wow something we knew nothing of yeah we knew absolutely nothing about and so when we were in the park he with diabetes uh 
if it's not treated with insulin, it's a child will, will basically, you can eat all the food you want, but it won't help you. And you drink all the water you can. And he was drinking copious amounts of water, but it wasn't helping him. So he's actually dehydrating. And, and back in the day before they discovered insulin, they, they would dehydrate to death. So it, our, when we were hiking in Yosemite, he was so dehydrated and we didn't know anything about that because he was drinking more water bottles than us and he's chugging water and we thought man that kid is really healthy but he was being dehydrated and he was, went into a waterfall there and he filled up a life straw with water and he was drinking the water from the waterfall he was just so thirsty anyway he got treated of course in the hospital we spent four days uh, recovering and learning how to handle type 1 diabetes and then he's such a brave kid two months later he was standing on the top of um, south sister in central oregon you know he took He's been around the world. He's been to Indonesia and places like that and found insulin and and, and just not let his challenge uh, keep him from being an explorer. So he often says, you know, I may have type 1 diabetes, but it doesn't have me. And so that uh, just this year, three years after that diagnosis, we went back to Yosemite. He, he had told us, he said uh, that it, he was so dehydrated there. The experience was so bad for him he said i never want to go back to that place but then over time he said you know what i think i need to go back to that back there and re-experience it so this year we we went back and um it was just a an amazing experience for him to just put all those fears behind him and he actually walked up the trail to that very same waterfall and dunked his head in there and he stood there for a long time and we just sat back me and carol it's a it's an emotional thing for us, <laughs> but we just sat there and, and watched him, and it just seemed like all of his inhibitions and fears uh, and, and the the stress from that experience and the kind of trauma of the whole thing was washed off in the waterfall, and he came out with a, a huge smile on his face, and he was almost like a new a new person. So, yes, for three, <laughs> there's three, and I'm trying not to cry on the last one. <laughs> and that's your oldest son, Peter, right? That, yeah, that's Peter. Well, nice job, Peter, for tackling those uh, those challenges. That's what life is about. Don't uh, let them control you. You control them. So awesome job. Could your heart be more full after listening to Peter's recollection of watching their son overcome such a mental, physical, and emotional hurdle. The very place that type 1 diabetes took a grip on him, he returned to officially reclaim his independence over diabetes. Way Way to go, go, Peter. Peter. (laughs) Wow, nicely done. (laughs) Yeah, that was a great story. Lisa, what else stood out to you? I was fascinated with the idea of color coding. Like when you have multiple people. Like what all do they color coat? Was it toothbrushes, underwear? Maybe I shouldn't mention those two things right next to each other. uh, Backpacks, toothbrush, (laughs) helmets. That was smart for a family. Yeah. Well, you don't want to wake up in the morning in the dark, putting your underwear on and find that you've put your sister's underwear on. Oh, God. (laughs) Right? Amen. (laughs) I don't know where to go with that. It's a brilliant idea. It was super smart. I don't know which of them. I assume there was Carol came up with that idea, but whew, brilliant. What else? Uh, just getting that mental break with audiobooks and hiking seems smart, especially with kids. Yeah, I think the hiking would be smart for anybody because that physical exertion, that real hard push, and being able to get some alone time would be good, especially five people in that Jeep. I just cannot, since we've got the same vehicle, I can't imagine how they do that. I mean, you make do and you do what you do, but... Oh. Well, what's that game? I Spy? You can play that. As long as I'm not in the back seat, those kids can make do. <laughs> I'll try and keep you awake. But then Carol had a really good idea of doing the audio books as well. So as they're hiking, uh, they'd be listening to an audio book, the kids would, and that makes that time go much faster. So if you got a kid that can't get over that mental hurdle of hiking for three, four hours at a time, uh, add an audio book to the mix. Yeah. And it sounds like it worked really good. Well, these days, these kids have these earbuds in their ears all the time. So why not learn something? 
Yeah, exactly. Right. That's what Peter was saying. Pretty smart. And that was only part one. A ton of great information and inspiration that Peter and Carol provide. Look forward to part two next Thursday. Our interview with the Epic Family Road Trip is our longer format interview. So we split these into two episodes for your downloading pleasure. Don't worry. New episodes are released each Thursday. In next week's episode, we learn more about the finer details of Peter and Carol's setup with their Jeep. They talk a little bit about their motorhome. Oh, and they added a trailer as well. So we're going to talk about that. And what else do we talk about? We talk about finances and enjoy more road stories from their four years of overland travel. Remember, it's a good idea to visit the show notes page on our website at ghtoverland.com slash podcasts and select the Epic Family Road Trip episode. All the details and helpful links are already there for you. Be sure to send your questions, suggestions, and feedback to ghtoverlandpodcast at gmail.com. We'd love it if you'd connect with us on the social media at ghtoverland. We're mostly active on Instagram and Facebook. However, you can still send us a tweet on the old Twitter if you'd like. And of course, feel free to share the GHT Overland podcast with your friends. If you enjoyed the episode, it would mean the world to us if you slid over to rate and review the podcast. Then be sure you're a subscriber. It's free and you get an automatic uploads of each new episode. Sweet. So you can listen to it offline, of course. So go give the GHT Overland Podcast a little extra love on your podcast platform of choice. Thank you, and we will see you next Thursday for part two of the GHT Overland Podcast with Peter and Carol from the Epic Family Road Trip. Oh, and be sure to go check out their YouTube channel. And that is at the Epic Family Road Trip on YouTube. Bye. Bye.